I'm Kevin Kosar of the R Street Institute, and I'm here today with Catholic University's Matt Green, who co-authored the book, Choosing the Leader, Leadership Elections in the U.S. House of Representatives with Loyola, Loyola University's Douglas Harris. Welcome, Matt. Thank you. This is your sixth book, is it? Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Your others are on the House Speakership, Washington, D.C., Minority Parties in the House, Trust and Mistrust in Society, and the Freedom Caucus, right? Correct. So what prompted you to do this book on house leadership? So uh, this book started, actually, it's an uh, uh, instance of um, serendipity. It started when I was doing my dissertation research on speakers, which became my first book, on Speaker of the House. And I was at Boston University doing uh, research into the papers of Speaker John McCormick, uh, who was the speaker after Sam Rayburn, so um, in the late 1960s. Uh, and I found this file that said telegrams to McCormick supporting his race for speaker. So he had run for speaker in 1969, and he was challenged by another Democrat named Lee Udall. And I thought, well, that's kind of interesting. Let me look at that file. And I found all these telegrams from other Democrats saying, we'll, we'll support you for your election for speaker. And it occurred to me this could be an interesting set of data. You could analyze it and look to see what explains why someone would vote for or commit to John McCormick as speaker versus his opponent, Bill Udall. So I found the Udall, in the Udall papers, I found some data on who said they'd support him. And it ended up being a, a paper that I wrote on uh, that leadership election. And then I, uh, Doug Harris reached out to me and said, hey, you're someone who studies leadership elections. That's great, because I do too. And he had just written a paper about the race that Newt Gingrich had run in 1989 for WIP, and he had published on that. So we sat down and said, well, let's collaborate. So we did some uh, one-off papers about individual races, and then Doug said, you know, maybe it's time for us to, to do a book. So we took that data we had already written about and then um, collected more data on more races, and uh, 14 altogether, uh, and that became the basis for the book. Okay. So how does this book differ from the previous book on the speakership? Is it more quantitative, more qualitative? Is the focus broader? What's, what's the difference? Well, both books have both quantitative and qualitative elements to it. Um, so this one, we do some regression analysis, but we also do a lot of qualitative analysis and narratives about individual races that we study. The, the speaker book um, is really about what motivates speakers of the house to do the things they do, what drives them as leaders. Um, and the traditional wisdom is they do things because their party wants them to. But what I argue in the book is that it's more complicated than that. They think about other things. Um, they think about their own districts, they think about their own preferences, they think about what their role is as the speaker of the house, um, their relationship with the president, etc. cetera. Uh, but that is an historical book also. So that what goes from Sam Rayburn uh, through, I think it ends with the very beginning of Nancy Pelosi's speakership. Um, this book is not about what motivates leaders. It's really about what explains why a lawmaker would choose one candidate over another mm -hmm. in a leadership election. And one of the things that makes that interesting is that these are usually within, for the most part, except for speaker elections, they're within parties. So if everyone in a party presumably agrees, what happens if they have a choice between two people running? And that's where you see these interesting patterns emerge about uh, that, that show these differences and divisions within political parties. So how did you and uh, your co-author divide up the work? Were you the quantitative guy and he was the archival guy, or was there no clear division of labor and just? Um, so it was a combination. Uh, I, I, did, uh, I did more of the quantitative analysis, and Doug did more of the qualitative analysis, but we also divided it by particular races. So for example, because um, you know, Doug had you know, knew a lot about the, the Gingrich race, for instance, um, and I have written about the McCormick race. You know, there, there's some division of labor there, um, and then it all, and then it was kind of also some degree of you know what do you want to write about? We divide the book into categories based on type of leadership races. So, um, if one of us is really interested in this open competition where there's no incumbent and it's a free for all, uh, then we would take primary primary responsibility for that. Um, if one of us was more interested in challenges to the heir apparent, where someone is supposed to take the next, be sort of the elected person, or the next person in line for a position, but some other people throw their hats in the ring, um, then that author would take that on. But it was definitely collaborative because we would write these chapters and then we would send them back and forth and revise them. Um, it was a really a great experience to work with Doug to put this book together. 
were interviews of those in, in the House or staff there a part of the mix? We did do some interviews. We did interviews with some folks who had run for leadership positions. We did some interviews with staff who were familiar with these leadership races. And that helped us get not only insights into specific races, what was going on, uh, but also learn more generally about the politics of these races. So for example, we did an interview with a member who, um, who was not running in this race, but it was a race uh, in 1980 for Republican whip between Trent Lott and Bud Schuster. And the person we talked to had some inside information. He said that, he told us for instance, that when Schuster had lost, um, which was a close race, uh, but Schuster really thought he was gonna win. He was so uh, upset that he actually had on his wall a list of all the members of the Republican conference. And he would go over it repeatedly, try to figure out which ones, in his opinion, had lied to him and said they would vote for him when they didn't. Mm -hmm. Well, you mentioned whips. Book is not just about the speaker. Who are the leaders of the House under your definition? So there's a lot of, in the contemporary House, both parties have a lot of leadership positions. Um, we look at elected leadership positions, but even within that definition, there are a lot of them. So the book necessarily, we, we have to limit ourselves somehow. So we look primarily at the Speaker of the House, um, we look at the majority and minority leader, which is the kind of the next down in the ladder, and then we look at the whips, the majority and minority whips. But then each party has deputy whips or chief deputy whips. Democrats have an assistant, to, an assistant speaker position. Uh, there's conference chair, conference vice chair. So there's lots of different leadership positions, and many of them are elected. So it can get you know there's there could, we actually found counted over a hundred of these uh, races where there was competition from 1961 through uh, 2014 or so. Mm -hmm. So the positions you looked at, speaker, majority leader, minority leader, whips, unless you're giving anyone, let us know. Just for viewers, how do you describe those positions? How do they differ? So if we start with the Speaker of the House, which is the highest ranked position in the House of Representatives, um, this is a person who, this is the one leadership position that's actually mentioned in the Constitution. So it's a constitutional officer. Um, that position has uh, significant responsibilities um, helping the, usually it's, it's from the, the person from the majority party, uh, necessarily. Um, so that person is responsible for setting the legislative agenda for the party, serving as a spokesperson for the party, uh, helping members of that party get elected and reelected. Um, entering into negotiations with leaders in the Senate and the White House, um, and generally helping to protect and defend the, the institution of the House. When you go down to the next level, so in the majority party you have a majority leader, and this is the person who's next in command, if you will. Uh, this person helps um, implement the agenda, uh, keep track of weekly scheduling, so at the end of each week usually that person's the one on the floor saying this is what we're gonna do next week, um, and helping the speaker in, in party duties. Um, and then below that would be the, well, and then I'll go over to the Republican side, or the minority side, in this case it's Republicans, the minority leader, um, and that's the highest ranked person in the minority party because they don't have the speakership. So that person has the same responsibilities as the majority leader, plus the responsibilities of the speaker, being a spokesperson for the party and so forth. And then below that are the whips, and they're primarily responsible for helping to build majorities or counting votes to say, yes, we have the votes to pass this, no, we don't have the votes to pass this. Um, this is how we could get the votes to pass this or not, et cetera. So you reference that only the speaker is mentioned in the Constitution. Uh, and the reference is, if I sort of recall, pretty brief. Where are the job descriptions for these different positions? Are they written down, written down anywhere in extended form? Or is it just a sum of habits over mm -hmm. time? So uh, my, my recollection, if I remember, is that both parties have these established in their own party rules. They will say, you know, this leader is responsible for this, um, that person is responsible for that. Uh, but since it's not in the Constitution, obviously it can change. So if the Democrats in the House decided, you know what, we really want the Speaker to be in charge of counting votes and we'll just get rid of the whip position, they, they could do that. I don't know why they'd ever do it, but they could do that. Um, so there's some flexibility in what their responsibilities are. And to some extent, I think these have evolved over time as um, you know, the, the requirements of leaders and the expectations on members have changed. Um, so uh, the idea that you would have all these leaders, not just 
speaker or leader with doing things, it speaks in part to how much more complicated life has gotten in Congress. As opposed to say 60 years ago, you don't have to raise half a million dollars to get elected, there's no television that you have to worry about as a member. So there's, there's fewer pressures, um, but now that there are a lot more pressures, you need a lot more folks to help a party achieve its day-to-day -day objectives. Right. So getting to how these folks become the leader, uh, you've already referenced elections, you've referenced the word partisan or party. Lay it out for <coughs> viewers. What's the mechanics? When do these elections happen and, and how do they happen? So let's leave the speakership aside for a minute because it's unusual, it's different than the others. Um, generally when these happen, if they happen, is, uh, in other words, if there is a competition between two or more folks, uh, they'll usually happen shortly after an election, uh, usually within a, a matter of weeks, maybe a month. Um, the party gets together as a group and um, you have the candidates uh, officially announced. They'll often have members in, who support them uh, nominating them, giving nominating speeches, saying this person would be a great whip, you should totally elect her, someone else saying, well, my candidate's really good, and then you have an actual vote process. Now, the voting varies by party and over time. Um, for the races that we look at, for the most part, the votes are counted, uh, but they are anonymous. So you have an actual balloting process, usually a piece of paper, you write down who you're voting for, fold the paper over, hand it up, it's counted by tellers that are chosen um, by each of the sides, I guess, or the candidates who are running. Uh, and then the final tally is announced. There's no names. You don't know how someone actually voted. Um, and then in the case of more than two candidates, if someone doesn't get an absolute majority, whoever has the fewest votes drops out, and then you have another round of balloting. So this is where the politics can get very interesting because it sometimes happens that someone who's in last place has, or next to last place, has gotten people to say, I'll vote for you on the next round. And so even though they didn't get the most votes the first time, those second round commitments come in and they end up getting elected. Uh -huh. The speakership, that Speaker election's a little different? Speakership's a little bit different because it's actually a speaker by the whole house, not just within each party. So it's a two-stage process. The first is the party has its election to choose its nominee. And that happens usually at the same time as these other leadership elections. And so the majority party picks a nominee, the minority party picks a nominee. Then you have a vote on the first day that the House meets. Um, and that is a public vote. You, and it's a roll call vote. So you, you are going through, it's an old school roll call back before they had electronic vote. And they go through each person alphabetically and they stand up and say who they're gonna vote for. Right? McCarthy or Pelosi. And then they count it up at the end. So um, usually the majority party wins the speakership election. That's generally, that's happened really for most, really for modern history, certainly in the House, because everybody in the majority is supposed to support whoever the, the party chose. But it is theoretically possible for someone to get up and vote for the other side's candidate or to vote for someone else altogether who isn't mm -hmm. even running. And if the uh, if no one gets a, an absolute majority, uh, then uh, you, may, you may have another round of balloting. Uh, this happened in the House in the 19th century when the parties were fractured over issues, uh, you know, regional issues, slavery, where you could have rounds and rounds and rounds and rounds and go on. We don't have that situation now, but it does complicate things. So if you want to be speaker, you have to have a majority of your party support you. Then you have to have the whole party be willing to support you on the floor of the House. Right, which is probably an argument for why the speakership is not done anonymously, because they don't want people to defect. If you defect it. Right, <laughs> so um, whether that was the intent or not, that's one of the reasons that you don't see very many of these defections. Mm -hmm. And it's happened time and time again. It happened to John Boehner, for instance, where you had some rebels in his party at one point saying, next election, we're getting rid of him. And they had a list of them. 30 Republicans or something that said, oh yeah, we'll totally vote against you know, Boehner. And then when their name's called, they go Boehner because mm -hmm. you want publicly to challenge the likely Speaker of the House of Representatives and all their friends in the party. And who knows what interest groups or lobbying groups might say, well, we're just not gonna fund you anymore and they're cutting off access. It's a very risky proposition to oppose your own party's nominee. Nancy Pelosi had a similar situation. A lot of Democrats were disgruntled with her. They said, we're not gonna support her for Speaker. Um, 
but when you get to the floor of the house and the cameras are on, are you really going to say no to someone who is likely to get elected anyway? It's a very risky thing to do. Right, and if you're a Dem say a Democrat and you openly vote against your party's candidate for speaker, and it throws the election to the Republicans, A, you're a pariah in your party, and B, you're probably not gonna be able to caucus all that easy with Republicans anyway, who aren't bound to trust you. Right. You it's, can be it, homeless. Yes, exactly, right? You, you may find yourself on a really uh, really bad committee and no one wants to work with you. Uh, you know, and speakers have tremendous power, both formal and informal, and so it's a very risky thing. Um, so in many cases, these are protest votes where they simply, and if they're smart, if a member's smart, they'll clear it with the person themselves. They'll say to Pelosi, look, I, I just can't. I promise I vote against you. My district's very conservative. But once I do this, I want to work with you. And Pelosi might say, okay. Um, but if she says, no, I need you to vote for me on the floor, it's a dangerous proposition to decide to defy her and, and vote against her. Right, right. Well, I guess for viewers out there, Many of them, I think, lament the fact that there's not more bipartisan activity in Congress, and you know, why can't we, you know, lead together and that sort of thing. And reading your book on the on the election, it kind of reminds everyone that the House, by its very nature, is a partisan entity, and presumably, it's mostly always been. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a majoritarian institution, and it has been uh, for much of its history, certainly since the late 19th century, when it. Uh, began to change its rules to empower a majority. Now, if we didn't have political parties, then that majority could be anything, could be any group that want to get together. But we're not getting rid of political parties. They're a part of American political life. So with that in mind, if you have a party that has more seats than the other party, in the House of Representatives, uh, you're able to write the rules, you're able to choose who's on the committee, or at least for the majority side, you stack the committees, you have more members, you set the agenda, there's all kinds of ways that you can influence uh, outcomes. And so that's why elections to the House can be very high stakes, because the majority has a tremendous advantage over the minority. And they have very, very strong incentives, clearly, to vote with the party. You'll get something out of it. That's right. There's a lot of incentives, and they're both um, instrumental, so I get something in exchange. There's also a lot of informal pressures. Um, you know, Steny Hoyer, who's the current majority leader, uh, once talked about wanting to create a, a culture of cooperation or a culture of loyalty where you get up in the morning and say I'm voting with my party. You don't need someone to promise you something that's just part of the way you see your life on the hill and if you can get that then you have tremendous power as a majority as a leader in the majority party in the house. So thinking of these different leadership positions um, how long does it take for someone to become a long path typically or can people sail in on their second term? So it depends on two things. It depends on what leadership position you want and to some extent it may depend on party. So these lower level positions that I mentioned earlier we don't really write about in the book, um, conference chair, conference vice chair, um, these sorts of things, um, it, it may not take very long to get one of those positions. There tends to be a lot of turnover in them, they're often term limited, um, so, for example, um, you know, Liz Cheney, I think, is in her second term, and she's the chair of the Republican Conference, something like that. It didn't take very long for her to get into leadership. So if you're skilled and ambitious, it's possible, and that's true of both parties. For positions that are higher up, like Speaker Majority Leader Majority Whip, um, that can take longer, just because you have folks who've been there for a while, and you also... Um, you may have more competition for those positions, and so it's harder to get them. Here, I think you also see a difference between parties. So the Republicans have, for whatever reason, seen more turnover in their leadership positions, and it hasn't taken as long for some of these folks to get leadership posts. I mean, I think Kevin McCarthy in his second term was deputy whip, and then his third term was whip, something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, so he moved up very quickly. On the Democratic side, uh, it's taken longer. So you know, Steny Hoyer, I think, was elected in like 81, or early 80s, or something like that. He wasn't, he didn't enter leadership for, I think it was a decade or so before he got his first elected leadership position. Um, and Pelosi, I think it was something like 10 or 15 years before she got a leadership position. Um, so that can take a while just because it's higher up, but I think also 
the Democrats traditionally have a system where people are in leadership for a longer period of time, so you have to wait longer to get into those top posts, whereas Republicans have seen a lot more turnover. So, uh, viewers might think when it comes to choosing a, a chamber leader, the biggest thing is ideology. You know, you're Democrat, so you've got to be liberal, not too liberal, but you have to be a certain liberalness, and that's that's what they're looking for. And Republicans, same thing. You're conservative, you need to be right on particular issues. That's that's really the key factor in choosing leaders. Your analysis shows that it's not quite that simple. What what are the factors that you found that affect who gets to choose to be the leader? So, um, and I'll I'll preface this by saying that in each one of the things that we enjoyed about writing the book is sort of finding little things that can matter in individual races. That obviously each race is going to be different, um, and I can talk more can talk more about that. But what was also really interesting was finding our analysis of fairly uh, fairly consistently that two sets of variables matter. Um, one set had to do with the professional connections between a candidate and a lawmaker. So is a lawmaker on the same committee as a candidate? Is a lawmaker from the same state as the candidate? Um, those are the kinds of things that make them more likely to know that candidate and work with them professionally. And those are fairly consistent in explaining the likelihood of voting for one candidate over another especially state delegations, which almost always predicts how someone's going to vote in these races. Um, the other uh, set of factors have to do with lawmaker goals, the kinds of things that they want. And can a candidate make a persuasive case that they'll help them achieve those goals? So for example, re-election, right? that matters to members. Is a lawmaker demonstrating that they care about re-election? For example, are they donating money to their campaign? If they are, they're more likely to get that person's vote. Um, Policy, that's where ideology fits in. And we do find that uh, measures of ideology uh, explain a lot of races, in, uh, le in a lot of leadership races. But it's not the only thing, and sometimes it doesn't. Um, for example, in the 1989 race for Whip with uh, Newt Gingrich, ideology doesn't really play much of a role in that race. Um, it was about, um, it was in part about uh, style, it was also in part about um, whether members felt like Gingrich was going to help the Republicans get a majority. Younger members, uh, those kinds of folks were more likely to support Gingrich. Ideology doesn't help us explain that race. Um, and then the last thing would be influence. So if members feel that a lawmaker is going to help them, they're a junior member, they'd like to have more influence. Is this a candidate who says, I will promote junior members, I will give them more opportunities. Those things make those junior members more likely to support them. So you've got professional connections and the goals of lawmakers. And that's consistent uh, across time, from 1965, the first race we, we write about, Gerald Ford's election, through the mid-2010s. Mm -hmm. um, it just comes up, those come up over and over again. So <clears throat> this is really about retail politics. It's about individuals going and making asks of other members of the legislature and getting them to commit and to see some sort of So retail is part of it, and part of it, and, I, and I'll say more about that in a minute, I mean, part of it is just how a candidate frames their campaign. So if they're running on a campaign of helping junior members, that alone, without having to make specific promises, can help make it more likely junior members will vote for them, for instance. And of course, committee and state delegations don't have to do with retail necessarily. But, and this is true, we, when we look at these races, we find that the variables that we control for, that we, uh, we measure, explain some of the variation in vote choice. But they don't explain all of it. Uh, and there's always a good amount that isn't explained. And that could be retail, not just the things I'm talking about, like donating money, but things that can't be measured. And we fully acknowledge that that happens in these races. So someone might be on the fence between two candidates, and one of them says, you know, if I'm elected, I'll get some money from Wood Bridge for your district. Or um, I'll get you that subcommittee position that you want. Um, that may not be observable, we may not know if that happens, but we know from interviews and from anecdotal data that that does happen in these races and can make, in theory, make a difference in how folks vote. So yes, if you're running for a leadership election, um, you want to think about how every member, what they need individually as well as what they might need as a group. And those who run for leaders, particularly those who are successful, 
do they tend to come from positions that gave them access to the sort of authorities and powers that are valued by other members, like the ability to give somebody a bridge in their district? Mm. Um, or is it all over the place? You can have backbenchers rising up to leadership. So yeah, it's not. There's no. Ex um, there's no single path that people will take if they're moving into leadership. Some do move from a position of um, where they're able to give things. So for example, Jim Wright, when he ran for majority leader in 1976, uh, he was on the Public Transportation and Public Works Committee. So that's a great committee where you can give people bridges, roads, right, help people out. And he had a track record of doing that. Um, other folks like Newt Gingrich, he was not a significant, he wasn't like a major legislator. He wasn't on one of these big committees that hands out goodies. So for, for him, it was less about being able to give those things and more about the way he framed his campaign and the way his track record in um, helping the party as a whole um, win uh, political battles, procedural battles, his emphasis on communication. So it was a different skill set that helped him uh, get elected in that case. Yeah, so the, as opposed to kind of who gets what say purchasing of votes, but the getting people to commit to you because you're going to give them something. There are those who've risen to leadership based upon vision. You referenced Gingrich, but there was also kind of the, the 1980 race with Bob Michelle, uh, who was challenged uh, for majority leader, was it? Uh, when will be minority leader. Minority leader, right. Guy, by Guy Vanderjock. Mm -hmm. And uh, what they represented to the folks who were voting for them, uh, different styles Sure, absolutely. So, uh, so when Michael was running for minority leader in 1980, he had been whiff, uh, and his emphasis was on county votes, building majorities, working with Democrats when necessary, opposing when necessary. Um, he was more of an older school type legislator. Uh, Guy Vanderjack was the head of the uh, NRCC. He was a campaign person. So he, for him, it was about um, winning majority. Right? You got to attack Democrats. You got to focus on communication. In some ways, he um, was a, a he was kind of an early indicator of the direction the party would end up going with Newt Gingrich, but it was 1980, not 1989. So, um, so Michael had he the Republican Party at the time had a larger percentage of members who agreed with Michael's approach. You know, legislate. You know, Reagan is president. We have the Senate. We can we could get some Democrats to vote with us and build majorities. Whereas Vanderjack's approach is sort of, yeah, okay, it's communication, it's television, it wasn't seen necessarily as a serious job for the minority leader. So, um, so that, that factor mattered. I would also note, though, that um, both of them did give money to candidates um, and especially try to win over freshmen. One of the things that we found in our archival research was a whip count by Bob Michael. Um, uh, and I should note, because as a side note, I mentioned that these votes aren't actually count it. So the question is, how do we know how people voted? Well, we, we generally look at whip counts. We look at the folks who are running for leadership and see who did they say was going to commit for them, commit to them, uh, and use that as a proxy. So, but we found one of these whip counts that Michael had kept, and he had these numbers in them. It was, it was like a thousand here, a thousand there, a thousand there. Uh, and I realized, looking at it, that this was money he had given to folks. He was keeping track of who he had donated to. As part of that campaign to run for leader. Mm -hmm. And we found that and verified with FEC data. It matched perfectly. So he was also thinking retail as well as style and approach that fit the party. Yeah, interesting. Speaking of money, how much can somebody seeking a leadership position give to another member of Congress? Is there any limit set in the House? Or? So there are legal limits. Um, the standard approach is if you're running for leadership, you create a leadership pack or an L pack. You raise a bunch of money, and then you give those to folks in your party. Uh, there is a limit, it's either five or $10,000, or something like that. And what's interesting there is, um, you know, that's a drop in the bucket yeah. if you're running for Congress. Like five grand, no difference you can make. And yet we find this relationship between money and the vote. So one of the things that we argue in the book is, this is not, a, this is not money that saves the, the political future of these other candidates. It's a signal, it's saying, I care about your reelection to the point, to the extent that the money I raise will go to you to help you. And if you give it to enough members and people know it, you're sending a signal to the whole party 
that I will help the party as a whole. I'll help party-wide you know, fundraising. I'll do that kind of uh, grunt work as a leader that would help the party as a whole. So yeah, there's a, there's a limit on, these, on this money for sure, but it is a, a really valuable signal in these leadership races that the candidate cares about the members' re-election goals. Well, yeah, and I would guess since leadership positions, one of the requirements of the job is to raise money and to disperse money to members of your party, what you're basically showing is that you've got the chops to do the job. Right, exactly, that you can do it. That's true, too. I mean, if you, if you give everyone 10 bucks and, you, and because you just don't have enough money, that suggests that if you're a leader, you wouldn't be very good at fundraising. Mm -hmm. So you and Professor Harris mentioned in the book, The Rise of Dark Money Affecting House Leadership Races. Sounds kind of ominous. Uh, but you have plutocrats, <laughs> you have plutocrats who are you know, buying legislators' commitments to particular leaders. What's, what's going on with that? How does that work? So that's at the end of the book, and it's more speculative at, our, at that you know, from us than anything because it's partly hard to, to track this money. It's, mm -hmm. it's a question about whether or not the, um, the greater ease with which money can flow through the electoral process, uh, and especially if it can't be uh, monitored or measured as well as uh, political action committee money, if that has an effect on leadership races. I have not seen evidence of that yet, uh, mm -hmm. certainly not in recent races, um, and it may not have an effect at all. Um, there's a way in which it could be problematic if you're a leadership candidate and word gets out that you bought your race because one wealthy person gave a lot of money indirectly to campaigns. Um, because then it looks like you are closely affiliated with some outside interest. And even members who might vote for you and say, that's money, help me, this money might help me, they might ask themselves, do I want this person as our leader? Because they might listen to me or they might listen to the wealthy backers. If it goes against my interests, it could be problematic. So it's still very early to know if that mm -hmm. would make a difference. Um, what I, I, I do think we can say is that even with the rise of these additional sources of money, um, it's, not, it's, it's not changing the importance of fundraising. If you are a leader, you still create a leadership pack. You still raise money. You still give it out. You don't it doesn't get um, lost in the, in, you know, in the larger volume of money flowing in the political system. Okay, so to get a leadership position, the impression one gets is that it's, it's a lot of work. You've got to get people to commit to you, you've got to raise money to give it to them, you've got to sell them on a vision, um, you have to be trusted, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Lots of effort. But that doesn't mean everybody who's gotten a leadership position has Toiled their way to the top. There have been some who've kind of been accidental leaders. How does that happen, and what are some probable examples? <laughs> so uh, it does happen from time to time where you have someone who gets into a leadership position, and it seems almost as if it, it was quite by accident or they kind of back into it. Um, you know, speaker Paul Ryan, some might argue, was an example. Uh, we became he was sort of the reluctant speaker uh, in the fall of 2015. Um, you know, another example uh, I would say would be after the 1998 elections when Newt Gingrich uh, resigned from the House and then Bob Livingston, who was the chair of the Appropriations Committee, suddenly announced on the floor that he was leaving and there was this power vacuum. And suddenly Dennis Haster, who was a deputy whip, I believe, suddenly became speaker of the House of Representatives. Mm -hmm. uh, when this happens, it tends to be in these kinds of crisis situations where someone who is in the leadership position or is the heir apparent, for whatever reason, can't has to withdraw, uh, passes away, some crisis emerges, and you don't have someone next in line who can immediately mm -hmm. take that position. Uh, and, so, uh, and so in those cases, yeah, you do have someone who uh, sort of you know, jumps in at the last minute. Having said that, I don't want to create the impression that they're completely devoid of any either ambition or experience. So mm -hmm. uh, you know, Paul Ryan, for example, had no interest in leadership but he had been chair of budget committee and was chair of the Ways and Means Committee. So he had some experience there. Um, it was a different kind of experience. Um, and then similarly with, with um, Dennis Haster, he'd actually run for a leadership position before that uh, and had lost and ran against Dick Armey for a majority leader, uh, came in last place, but he was a deputy whip. So um, these aren't truly sort of out of nowhere choices, but they are, uh, they do fall outside the kind of standard pattern of someone working their way up the leadership ladder. Right, yeah, and, and, and Ryan, if I recall, 
kind of styling yourself as the new GOP policy wonk, issuing various plans about, you know, this is how. So he was already showing a kind of policy leadership mentality before he fell into the position. Um, exactly, yeah. I think they convinced him to run because they said, if you don't do it, no one will be speaker, and then you won't get your policy visions enacted. <laughs> it's like, ah, but I'll be speaker. How am I supposed to get my policy visions enacted? Oh, well, you'll figure it out. So, you've been deep into the data and deep into the history um, and seen the way that leaders get picked. What are the consequences, for good or ill, of the way that leaders are selected today? Do we tend to get good ones, who know how to legislate, contend with the executive branch, or do we tend to get something else? Um, we get we do get some very good leaders, very skilled leaders, folks who um, not only listen to their members, but are able to kind of think strategically and have a larger vision. Um, but it's not a guarantee, because the process really is designed, uh, the way it's set up now, it's about uh, appealing to or pleasing the members of your party. And, um, and that may not necessarily correspond with the kinds of skills that are necessary to be effective in that leadership position. Um, sometimes folks work their way up the leadership ladder, as I mentioned, and so in each position they're, they're gaining some more skills, but that doesn't always work that way. Um, so one of the concerns um, that Doug and I have is about uh, the, the extent to which folks um, receive some training or some experience when they're running for leadership positions. And so uh, Doug and I put together this policy paper uh, recommending, um, you know, talking about potential problems with the status quo and recommending that the House consider some kind of leadership development program. Uh, we see this at the state level. We see it with um, groups like the Congressional Black Caucus that have this for folks who are not in Congress, but they want to get into leadership. Um, and it's a, in some ways a very effective way to help folks who have some interest and ambition to develop skills they may not acquire if they aren't already in leadership or if they think they'll acquire it just by campaigning for a leadership position and they may not. So um, that kind of program might help address uh, potential pitfalls in the way that the, that the House currently chooses its leaders. So I should reference that uh, the short study that you know, Professor Green and Professor Harris did is available on ledgebranch.org, L-E-G-B-R-A-N-C-H.org. Has the uh, kind of peculiar circumstance of the last 20 years where we have a House of Representatives that is narrowly divided changed the incentive structure for how leaders should behave and the type of leaders that end up being chosen to so um, there are probably some significant consequences for that competitive nature uh, of, uh, of the two parties in the House of Representatives. And, and Professor Francis Lee at the University of Maryland has written about some of the impacts of that more broadly. Um, the, the old uh, model, pre-1995 or 1994 election, Democrats had solid majority, they weren't losing it, Republicans were stuck in the minority. Um, you, uh, without that um, sense of hyper-competitiveness between the parties, there may have been less of an incentive to focus on re-election and think more about policy, the long-term policy objectives, um, and not to worry about each next election. I mean, leaders then did care. They obviously cared about the election. They didn't ignore it. Um, but if you were in the majority, in the minority, for example, you might say, well, we're never going to get a majority, so let's work with Democrats. Right? A leader might say, you know, I need you to vote with Democrats on this so you can get something. Um, in an environment that we're in now, the incentive, the, there's much more incentive to focus on the next election. And, this, and so your time frame shrinks dramatically. You're really thinking just two years and uh, thinking, you know, anything could happen in two years. So we've got to, you know, we've got to push our agenda. We have to think in a partisan way um, and, and definitely, like, push the other party to try to, to get seats from them. There's also, uh, it's also increased the instability of leadership positions, particularly the, the speakership. So before the 1980s, speakers usually were in office until they either died or retired. What you have now are speakers who generally are there until um, they lose re-election, like Tom Foley. Um, they have to resign because of some sort of scandal, which is often the result of the other party uh, pushing them and, and attacking them. Uh, or they lose a majority in, in the House. So one question is whether, it's sort of 
not a question, but when Boehner stepped down, it was hard to find someone to take his place, and that might be why. It's not like Sam Raver. Well, I'll just sit here and relax, and you know, it's a great job in Howard for 20 years. You may lose it in six months or a year, and if you do, people will blame you for it. It doesn't seem like as much of a, a job that you'd want to do as it had been in the past. Right, right, right. Well, speaking of current leaders, uh, Speaker Pelosi has intimated that she'll step aside at the end of the current Congress. How many folks are explicitly positioning themselves to take her place on the Democratic side? Yeah, so that key word is explicitly. Um, there's, a, there's often a kind of dance that members play with ambition uh, in leadership races where they sort of may have higher ambitions, but they don't want to come out too soon or too openly about it, uh, either because it, um, it's seen as baseless, frankly, uh, or it alienates uh, folks, or it gets your opposition ginned up and then they try to find someone to run against you. Um, especially with an incumbent who may retire in 2020 or may not, so it's, you have to be kind of cautious. Um, you know, Steny Hoyer, who's the majority leader, would be the traditional next in line for that position, but every Democratic speaker in modern times was previously uh, a majority leader or leader of a party, and Pelosi might be the exception, but generally he's sort of I know she's not, she's minority leader. Um, but it's not clear if Hoyer has enough support in the party to just take it. And there, are, because the top leadership in the Democratic caucus has been there for so long, there's a lot of members who have ambition who would like to move up. So there are other folks, um, uh, Hakeem Jeffries, uh, for example, uh, who's in the leadership. A lot of people talk about him as a future speaker. Sherry Bustos from Illinois. It, it could be a really interesting dynamic when Pelosi uh, leaves, because it could be that Hoyer just steps in, and that's it. Like when Rayburn left, McCormick took over, and you're done. Or it could be a situation where Hoyer decides he wants to run, but there's several others that challenge him. Or it could be that Hoyer decides, you know, I don't want the speakership, or I'm done. And then you have these, this sort of a possible open competition, which can get, um, which can even have three, four, or five people running, and it can get um, very interesting. Yeah, earlier you referenced that uh, in the Republican Party, leaders, uh, folks can move up a little more rapidly in their leadership. And last time around for the Democrats, this age of leadership issue became a big deal along with the question of diversity generally. It's a party that embraces diversity if you just keep elevating whites or white males to run it kind of internally a, a political problem. It seems with a large number of newer and younger Democrats that there is certainly a internal rebellion that is seeking a different kind of leader potentially. Right, so in the, the Republican leadership, I'd say, is where you have that issue about diversity. I mean, Liz Cheney is the only woman in leadership. I think that's what yeah. yeah. In the Democratic side, it was more about age. You have the same, or mm -hmm. seniority, the same people who've been there. Um, and both of which can have potential, uh, can, can breed frustration in their party. Um, disgruntlement, and so that becomes a challenge for those who are in leadership. Um, I think on the, um, you know, on the Democratic side, age certainly came up with respect to Pelosi. Um, I tend to see it at least partly more about a sense of wanting, yes, to some extent we want younger faces in leadership, but also just frankly we want young people to have a chance to move up in leadership. It can be very frustrating if you are ambitious, you're young, you have some great new ideas for the party, and then you hit this ceiling, you hit this brick wall, and you're just, you're not going to have any more opportunities. Um, I don't know what the solution to that is. I wouldn't necessarily say people have to leave if they're in leadership, mm -hmm. but that tension is still there in the Democratic caucus, and it's not going to go away until um, those folks who are more junior feel like they have a say in the leadership process and in decision making. I do think Pelosi's done a very good job in incorporating those folks into the decision making process. So she's met with heads of the Progressive Caucus, she's met with moderates, she said, okay, I'll put you on this committee, I'll put you here, you can have a say. Um, and that's done, I think, done a lot to help kind of alleviate those tensions. You don't want to be in a situation that parties have been in in the past in the House or the Senate where the top leadership is there, they never go away, they don't listen to anybody, no one has a chance to move up. That's an environment that's ripe for either rebellion or a lot of talented people just leaving, which can hurt the party in the yeah, and uh, Pelosi 
other leaders facing this kind of internal upheaval did, which was create some new leadership positions that give people the opportunity to put on a bigger hat and to feel better, like, hey, I'm part of this. Um, Republicans, meanwhile, is anybody clearly jockeying to take over should they win the chamber back in 2020? Well, uh, presumably McCarthy would be speaker because he's the minority leader. Uh, that'd be the, you know, the next move up for him. Uh, and then Steve Scalise would move up. You can have that kind of seamless transition where everyone just moves up, and that could very well happen in the Republican Party. But they also have folks who are young, ambitious, um, you know, have a lot of promise. You know, people talk a lot about Liz Cheney uh, and, and her leadership skill set. Would there be a place for her moving up in leadership? Or would she need to challenge an incumbent? Um, you know, Patrick McHenry, who was the deputy whip for a while, who is now a uh, committee ranking member, uh, but he was in leadership. Uh, maybe he would have interests uh, in coming back in again. Um, and of course, I, you know, there, there is a way in which people who are committee chairs or ranking members may not be in the leadership structure, but they still may want to move into leadership. And so it's always good to look not just at the folks who have who are in the leadership team, but also folks who are chair or ranking members of committees, um, and because they could also be candidates like Paul Ryan uh, right. and become a leader at some point. Well, I suppose the fun, the fun thing to do might be to take a look and see where uh, the various GOP leadership packs are at, and who's, who has them, who's got a lot of money in them, and who's dispensing it. And Absolutely. To see who's positioning themselves for something either in 2020 or, or long term. Yeah, that would be a good project, actually, to look and see the correlation between the not just establishment of a, of a leadership pack, but how much money it has, mm -hmm. and then if that person uh, throws their hat in the ring you know, for a leadership post. Mm -hmm. Well, you have nothing else to do, so. <laughs> It'll be our next project. Your next project. <laughs> Professor Matt Green, author of Choosing a Leader, thank you for joining me today, and thank you, viewers, for tuning in. See you at ledgebranch.org.